Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another worship service here at the Needville United Methodist Church on our YouTube channel. I hope and pray that you've had a safe and healthy week, and I am so glad to have you join us for worship this morning. Uh, two quick announcements before we get into service. First and foremost, uh, we are still having in-person worship here in our sanctuary starting at 9 o'clock in the morning and a second service at 1045. We're continuing to do all the social distancing protocols. Uh, the sanctuary is still split up so that uh, you are socially distant from other family units throughout the church. We also are now requiring that all persons that come into the sanctuary have masks on uh, to make sure that this sanctuary stays as safe and as healthy as it possibly can be for all who wish to come and worship in person. And of course, as I've said before, you are the one that may, has to make the w wise choice for you, whether or not you are healthy enough or whether or not you want, you want to journey outside of your home to come to worship. Please make your own decision based on what you know about yourself, your health situation, your family's health situation, and keep yourself as safe as possible. We will continue with our online services, of course, and our pre-recorded services, just like this one that come on at 1045 every Sunday morning. So don't feel like you're going to miss a service or miss something that's said. Everything that's happening in the pre-recorded services is happening in the in-person live worship here in the sanctuary. My second announcement that I would like to make is that every year we as part of the Needville Ministerial Alliance, which encompasses a number of churches around the area, we always do a community-wide vacation Bible school every summer for the kids of Needville. This year, because of COVID, we are going to do VBS, but it's going to be an online version of VBS for all the kids. Um, the registration is on our website and on our Facebook page. Feel free to go find it, fill out the registration, and send it in. Your, ki your kids will be involved in VBS this year, but it will all be online. Um, our group is working very hard to make sure that the online presence and the online uh, venue for VBS is just as fun and just as educational as VBS has been in the past when we were able to be in person. But because of COVID and everything else, we are not going to be in person this year. We are going to do everything online. So please register your kids, be a part of this, this wonderful tradition of the Needville Minister Alliance and our community, and let's teach all of our children what it means to be followers of Christ. That's all the announcements we have this morning. At this point, I'm going to ask you all to uh, stand where you are or see, stay seated and sing along. Our opening hymn is going to be hymn number 110, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Let us sing together.
Zion, through whom was the Prince of Darkness. Brothers and sisters, it's that time in our service where we come to God and we pray for our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors, our friends, the stranger, and the entirety of the world. Uh, hopefully, um, y'all have gotten the gist of how we do this here. Uh, if you have anyone that you would like to add to our prayer list, please let me know over this next week. You can email me, you can text me, you can call me, you can send a Facebook message to me, you can even comment here on the YouTube video down below or on our Facebook page. But whatever method is easiest for you, let me know a name that you would like to add to the prayer list. Um, if you would like to add some, someone to the prayer list but not have their name be said aloud on a YouTube channel, that's perfectly fine and I completely understand that. You're more than welcome to either send me the name and say, please leave it off, or you can just say, I have someone who is in need of prayer and we'll lift up those prayer requests as well uh, through the, throughout the services. This Sunday, uh, we have a number of prayer requests. A couple of them are are requested to be anonymous as they um, involve small children and therefore I do not wish to uh, give any information about any of them but as we know God knows not only what's happening but how to fix and take care of those that are in the midst of those problems so us lifting our prayers up to God are simply a formality for him to know that we care about these individuals and for our prayers to breach them. So this morning we do have about, uh, we do have a young child who is uh, a, one of our, um, who is a family member of one of our members here at the church who was diagnosed with COVID-19. We pray for uh, that child as uh, they continue to heal and get better. We pray for a couple of minors that are struggling with cancer we pray for their families, for, their str for strength and encouragement, for healing and for hope. And of course, above all, we pray for grace for each of those families and those members. We continue to pray for the Rural family as they continue to uh, grieve their loss at home. And finally, uh, I will give one last praise. My mother-in-law is doing spectacularly well. She is now living in an apartment and going through therapy after her successful um, and healing uh, transplant. So she is doing spectacularly well. Thank you all for your prayers. Um, continue to pray for her as she goes through the therapy. You know therapy can be something that needs extra strength, but um, she is doing very well, and it's because, thanks in, uh, in a large part to all the prayers that have been lifted up for her from all of y'all. So continue to uh, lift her up, but at the same time, say praises uh, that we worship a God who heals and delivers. 
Brothers and sisters, that's all that we have this morning um, as far as names go. If you have anyone, please write their name down. Let me know and we can add them to the list. Otherwise, let us go to God in a time of silent prayer. It'll be followed by the pastoral and then we will speak together the Lord's Prayer at the end. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. Because at the very least, we have this ability to worship together over this medium. Father, we give you thanks because no matter what this world throws at us, no matter what's going on outside, no matter what's happening in our society, you are still God. You love us unconditionally. And you seek to reconcile with your people and your children. So Father, this morning we lift up our hearts. We lift them up to you and we ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. This morning we lift up all the names that are on our hearts of people who are in desperate need at this point. Whether it is they are in need of healing Grace, peace, understanding, wisdom, courage, or strength. We know that all of these things and so much more is just at the mere fingertips of you. So we pray, as we remember all those names, that you would be with each and every one of them. Fulfill every need that they have so that they might turn to you. Father, you are a God who has promised to be with us always. Let those people know that they are not alone. That not only are you with them in spirit, which is more than any of us would ever need, but that their brothers and sisters in Christ are also with them in spirit. That we are also praying for them and thinking about them and seeking ways to help them. Father, we also lift up ourselves. Each and every one of us, Father, comes to this service with our own burdens, our own trials, our own temptations, and our own distractions. Father, with everything that's going on in the world, it is so easy for us to get distracted and look all other ways except the one that matters. So, Father, help this service. Help this time that we have together to be a refocusing of our energies and of our minds. That we might focus directly on you. With no other distractions, with no other regard to the outside world, but simply just looking towards you. Heavenly Father, be with us. Send your Holy Spirit upon us so that this worship service may be everything that it needs to be to glorify you and then to fill us in the process. So Father, as we lift up all of these stresses, all of the things that are on our minds and our shoulders, as we lift them up to you, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us. Fill us with your Spirit and let us remember the wonderful words that Christ taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's about that time for us to give our tithes and our offerings. Typically, we, of course, would be passing around the plate. So take this as a symbol of me passing the plate to you. Uh, you know that the Bible tells us that we are to give back to God 
uh, what he has given to us. And since the, since the fact that is that everything that we have in our possession, everything that we call our own is actually his, that he is allowing us to borrow and to use our job is to make sure that we use it for the glory of his kingdom and for the building of his kingdom here on earth. And so, brothers and sisters, I pray that you would give abundantly, that you would give out of the amazing gifts that God has graced your life with to give thanks to him for all that he has done for each and every one of us. I pray that you would give toward, with your tithes and your offerings so that we might be a beacon of light to the world around us that is set in darkness. Let us be the tools that bring king, the, king, the kingdom to this earth. Our scripture lesson for this morning comes from the first letter to the Corinthians from Paul in the 10th chapter, verses 31 to 33. Hear the words of the scriptures this morning. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, so that they may be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say thanks be to God. Will you bow your head in a word with prayer, in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we again give you thanks for this medium, this ability to worship together even when we aren't actually physically connected to each other. Your spirit connects each and every one of us so that when we worship together, even in this manner, we know that you are glorified. Father, we now ask that your Holy Spirit come upon us, break open our hearts and our ears, that the words that are about to be spoken be your words for your people, that bring us into better relationship with you and with our neighbors, so that we may become the true tools to build your kingdom that you have always called us to be. We pray all this in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. So this Sunday, we're starting a new sermon series. And what I'd like to start with is I want to see what's your initial reaction to a few phrases and words, what that happens to you when you hear these phrases and words. Let's see. Let's start with a, an easy one. Black lives matter. Oh, what about blue lives matter? matter. Or maybe all lives matter. How about another one? You must wear masks. Or the other side, it's no different than the flu. How about this one? Just two words. Republicans, Democrats. I think that should cover everyone about now, right? Are we all sufficiently triggered? There we go. In eight words or phrases, I have created a conflict with probably everyone that watches this video. Conflict surrounds us at every turn. If you have more than one person in a room, I guarantee you will have conflict at some point. It's just part of living in this world, isn't it? While we can say that heaven itself has no conflict because God is the authoritative being over the entirety of heaven, we don't live there yet. We're still living here. And as much as we're supposed to bring the kingdom to, to earth, I'm sad to report that that just hasn't happened yet. Bottom line, every day I go onto Facebook, I read an article, even I have a Zoom meeting, and I'm confronted with conflict. So, what do we do as Christians when conflict confronts us? What happens when conflict comes into each and every one of our lives? What do we do? How do we handle that conflict? 
Now, maybe you are someone who absolutely despises and hates conflict. You can't stand arguing. You get flustered easily. Your brain goes all haywire. You have, your, your skin starts to crawl. You get the goosebumps. You start to sweat. All those things. And so what do you do? You avoid conflict like it's the worst plague, including COVID-19. You avoid at all costs, right? Every one of us knows at least one person that is like that, if not ourselves being the part. Now, the other, the flip side is every one of us knows at least one person. Maybe we're the, maybe you're the one, but we all know at least one person that thrives in conflict, loves the argument. You can't even tell sometimes what their actual viewpoint is because you know that they love arguing so much that they will play devil's advocate all day long just so they can argue with even their best friend. All of us know at least one person that fits either of those two categories and I would almost be willing to bet that each and every one of us falls into that category, one of those two categories. Bottom line is that our society has become one where conflict elicits one or the other of these responses. Either we try to avoid and escape conflict like you find when you, when you see people that say, I am no longer looking at Facebook. I am signing off of my account and I'm never going back. I'm never watching the news anymore because it's so depressing. I'm not reading the newspaper. All those things. That's avoiding conflict. I'm never talking about politics. I'm never talking about... You know. The, you know. Or... Society says you're supposed to engage and defeat the enemy. We see this one a lot in like political debates. Ever sat down and watched the presidential debate or any other debate? I don't care what debate it's about. I don't care what office they're trying to run for. The bottom line is 99% of the time when you watch one of those debates, you never get the idea of what the, each candidate's propositions or stances are, what you hear is how better they are compared to their opponent and how horrible their opponent really is. The idea being that if you don't hold my worldview, if you don't agree to my opinions and my exact beliefs, I will destroy you. Now, which one do you think you fall into? Are you the kind of the person that can't fathom to lose an argument? That you will do anything and everything it takes to win? Even undercutting the other person's argument? Poking it as full as many holes as possible to make sure that they know that their opinion and their view is so wrong. Maybe you even make up some facts and you say them so confidently that the only way to disseminate, whether it's a true fact or a made up one, is to actually go and Google it on your phone. Or are you the kind of person who's, who looks at a situation that has conflict in it and says, you know what, just let them have it. It's not worth the stress to fight them. I'll just go and delete my status. I don't want to have this conversation. I don't want to have this argument. I don't want to have this conflict in my life. Just rather get rid of it. Escape and avoid. You know, when we think about conflict, those two ideas, those two options seem like the only two options you got. When you're confronted with conflict, do you run and escape and avoid or do you stand and fight and fight to the death? 
fight for victory. Think about it. If we disagree on a topic, either we have to avoid it or we have to have a conflict where one person has to win while the other person loses. Isn't that what society teaches us? Isn't that what our culture teaches us? Isn't that what, the, what we've learned from years of experience living on this globe? Well, yes, it is. But over the next month, what I want to show you is that there is a better way, a third way, a divine way. And it's all shown right here in this. It tells us what the third divine option is when we're confronted with conflict. And this is the one, this is what it is. The third divine option is a reconciling option. Now, if you don't believe me, if, you, if you're trying to, if you're sitting there going, well, what does he mean by a reconciling option? All you have to do is look to Jesus. Look at him. Jesus in his ministry of three years when he w became an adult and he ministered to all of Israel as he walked and wandered, as he had his 12 disciples around him, did he ever avoid conflict? No, of course not. He approached every single conflict that ever came to him. He took all of it on. He took it on, but he did so in an effort and with the sole purpose of reconciling those with whom he had conflict with to reconcile them to God. Think about the final prayer that Jesus utters right before he's about to die. In the garden of Gethsemane, may they be as one as you and I are one father. The prayer of unity. In the heat of such a conflict that would take his life. He is still seeking reconciliation for God's people. Both between person to person. And between God and creation. If you want a second way to understand this from God's perspective, think about it this way. God, the perfectly good and just and holy being, right? We've talked about that numerous times, how great and perfect God is. Instead of when he sees his creation, the jewel of his creation, human beings sinning and taking, going the opposite direction of him, instead of destroying his sinful and rebellious creation, instead of avoiding and ignoring his sinful and rebellious creation, what did he do? He sends his son, his only son, to die on the cross to reconcile us back to him. If this is how God handles conflict, maybe, just maybe, we should learn how to do it ourselves. This morning, I submit to you that if we are able to approach conflict in this world in the way that God approaches it, and that's through the reconciling option, then we will find that conflict is not a battleground where the bloodiest person wins. Nor is conflict something that one should avoid at all costs. What we will find is that conflict is actually a great opportunity that we as believers in Christ must embrace. Now, the scripture this morning from Paul in 1 Corinthians is one that I want to break down into three sections so that we can understand how we can start to understand conflict in a better way. 
And I want to start with the idea that conflict is an opportunity to glorify God. Let me say that again. Conflict is an opportunity for us to glorify God. Now in the 31st verse of our scripture reading this morning, Paul says that I, that Paul says this, and I'm, I'm going to put some emphasis on the parts as I read this verse to you that I didn't when I read the scripture a little bit earlier. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. In whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Now, what does that mean for us? What does it mean? What is the phrase to the glory for the glory of God? What does that phrase mean? I think it's one of those phrases that almost all of us have heard numerous times and we think we know it, but it's also one of those phrases that we have a number of them, right? Yet if someone were to actually ask us what does that mean? Our brains go blank. There's no other way to say it other than saying, well, it's for the glory of God. But what does it mean for Paul to say, do everything for the glory of God? What does that mean? And if we follow what, what, it, what it means, if you want a, diff, a, a simple, easy understanding of that phrase, it means that you put the goodness of God on display for the world to see. You take the goodness of God and you put it on display. That is what it means to do everything for the glory of God. You put his goodness on display for all to bear witness to. You become a looking glass through which God's light, God's goodness comes into this world. Now if we follow this statement by Paul to how we deal with conflict... Because Paul says, everything, do everything. How you eat, how you dress, how you work, who you're friends with, how you interact with those that are around you. It means how you conflict. How do you handle conflict? How do you conflict with your brother, your sister, your mother, your father? your grandparents, your neighbor, your friend, your enemy. How do you conflict with everyone in the world? If we're going to do it in the right way, we have to follow Paul's words. In everything you do, do it for the glory of God. So, how do we approach conflict in that way that when we engage in conflict, we are doing it for the glory of God. And let me tell you something. If you do this, everything will change. The way you speak to your spouse, the way you speak to your friends, the way you speak to your family, the way that you speak to your neighbor, the way that you interact with, your, with the stranger, with everyone else, even with your enemy. If you do this, if you follow this guideline, everything is going to change. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing, we ha first thing we have to do is we have to trust God. Now, in order to trust God, we have to know who God is, right? We have to know who we're dealing with, which means that we read the scriptures. It mean, means we go into prayer, which means we do the Bible studies and the, ser and the worship services and everything else. If we don't know God, how on earth could we ever trust him? So the first thing is we have to get to know God. We have to know him so well that we can trust him in what he says. Now the trust is the fact that we don't allow our emotions to dictate our, re our reactions. We trust in God. We have to know what God says about us. And we have to know what God says about them. And I put quotations around them because them is everyone else who's not me. What does God say about our neighbor? What does God say about our enemy? What does God say about every other human that is on this planet besides me? What does God say about me? What, how does def God define each of these people? Each of these kinds of people? Me and they. Me and them. How does God define these things? 
We have to learn this. We have to know this. Once we've soaked up those definitions, once we have, tr- have gotten to the point where we know God enough to trust him in what he tells us to do, then the next step is to obey what he's told us to do. Now obeying God is putting that trust into action by handing over the reins to our lives to him. It's asking, how do I handle this situation? Listening for the words and doing what he's told us and if you do those two things if you come to an idea if you come to the understanding you can trust God and you obey his command then the third thing is going to come immediately without question because if we trust God we will seek his counsel who doesn't seek the wise words of some of a trusted friend when they're in crisis So of course, if we trust God, we will seek his counsel. If when we receive his trusted counsel, we then will obey it, right? You don't get trusted words of advice from a trusted friend and then say, ah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. No, you seek out the trusted word of a friend because you trust him so that you can use it to influence and inform what you do. So when we receive his trusted counsel, we will obey it. And when we obey his trusted counsel, we will become imitators of Christ. Because that's exactly what Christ did. He followed the instructions of his father. And what does he tell us? Those who love me will obey my command. Now, if we can see that conflict is an opportunity to glorify God, then I want to move on to another idea. That conflict is actually also an opportunity to serve others. Not only is conflict a way to, an opportunity to glorify God, it's also a place where we can serve our brothers and sisters. Where we can serve the stranger. We can even serve our enemy. Now, I understand that when I wrote this down in my sermon, it was sounded so mm, stupid. How do we ever allow for conflict to serve others? And in all fairness, the reason that it sounds dumb is because society teaches us what? To look out for number one. Even all of our lives, I don't care who you are, I don't care how long you've lived on this earth, I don't care how good you think you are, we all know that the squeaky wheel always and forever gets the grease, right? If we don't look out for number one, if we don't take care of ourselves, who else is going to do that? Who else on this whole earth is going to put us over themselves? And while there may be one or two, the fact of the matter is we all know, especially as adults, right? And if we don't stand up for ourselves, if we don't stand up and say, this is the stand that I'm going to take, we're going to be doormats our entire lives, won't we? You know, let everyone just walk right over us. Use us for every other thing. At some point, we've got to take a stand. We've got to stand up and be our own person, right? We've got to be the ones that take care of ourselves. However, listen to verse 32 and 33 in the scripture this morning. It calls us to not be stumbling blocks to anyone and to seek the good of many but if we are trying to reconcile and restore a relationship then it can't be just about me can it those words of Paul he says I'm trying to be everything for everyone I'm he says I'm trying to make sure that I'm not a stumbling block for anyone that my life my words what I do and what I say aren't stumbling blocks for my brothers and sisters regardless of who they are Greeks Jews doesn't matter that I am not a stumbling block for them if they think about it when the conflict 
when we approach conflict in the traditional societal ways, if we approach it as attack and defeat, the conflict is about me winning that argument. It's not, it, the, the, the conflict isn't about making sure the other person feels good or it feels better or is okay with everything. All that matters is that when the argument is over, when the conflict is over, I'm the victor. I'm the one standing up. Notice that I language? Same thing with avoidance, honestly. Making sure that I'm protected. I'm avoiding the conflict so that my heart, my flesh, that my mind is fine. Don't care about them. I want to make sure that I'm okay. So I avoid. As long as we approach conflict in one of those two ways, the final verdict of conflict will either be I won or I escaped. But if we're trying to live into the unified, pr the, the prayer of unity that Christ offered in the Garden of Gethsemane, if we're trying to approach conflict in the divine way of reconciliation, then conflict has to include how my opponent feels after the conflict is over. Not only just how they feel, but are we reconciled back into a good relationship by the end of the conflict? Because if we're not, then we aren't doing reconciling. We're then doing I either win or I escaped. So how do we do this? Well, the first and foremost thing is we start by listening. I have to say this. Too many times in our world and in our society, we are people who are simply waiting for a chance to speak instead of listening for a chance to understand. Now think about it. You've been in conversations before where you're talking to someone and you can see it in their eyes. They have stopped listening to you. They found that kernel that you said and they have stopped listening. They're now in their own heads trying to figure out, okay, I'm going to say this and this and this and this. They're, they're putting their argument together. They're putting their logic steps together. They're not listening to a word you say. They're getting ready for when you take a breath so that they can then start talking themselves. And let's face it, we're all the same. We do the same thing to, to our friends and family, don't we? We don't listen We're waiting for that moment when we can speak. But when we listen to a person, especially when we're in conflict, when we listen to that person and treat them as a person, when we truly listen to their side, we actually start to see them as a person instead of seeing them as a problem, seeing them as the conflict. We see them as a child of God. Bottom line is we have to hear their words and their views, not just think of the best way to leave them alone or undermine their views. We have to listen to what they have to say to understand who they are. Now the second thing we have to do is we have to speak life into the relationship. Now I don't know about you, but I do know that there is an age-old tactic, especially in marriage, but it happens in families all the time. When you're in conflict with someone, especially when you're in deep conflict with someone, one of the tried and true methods, the silent treatment. Ever been on the receiving end of the silent treatment? Or maybe you're the one that's been giving the silent treatment to someone. You're just like, I don't even want to talk to you anymore. I don't want to deal with you. I don't want to talk with you because every time I talk to you, the conflict comes back up. I don't want to deal. No, no, done. Silent. Cut off. I don't know about you, but my question is, what does the silent treatment actually solve? Nothing. It just makes it deeper, doesn't it? All it does is highlight the fact that you're mad. It highlights the fact that you're hurt and you're injured. But it gives the other person no way to know how you're injured, why you're injured, or what to do differently the next time it happens. 
if you remain silent, how are they supposed to grow? How are they supposed to do anything different than what they've done? I could tell you so many relationships, and I'm not talking about just marriages. I'm talking about friendships. I'm talking about neighbors, n- neighborhoods. I'm talking about just common relationships. There are so many relationships that die because of lack of communication. Now, if we want to speak about marriage, you want to know what the number one reason for divorce is? Lack of communication. It's not money. It's not cheating. Because both of those stem from the same thing. They weren't communicating together to be able to talk to each other. When we speak life into a relationship, we go to the other person and tell them what they need to hear to be a better person, a better friend, a better spouse, or whatever. We engage them. I'm not saying talk down to them. I'm not going, saying going and talking to them and saying, you have to do this, 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 or this. No. It's listening to them first, listening to who they are, where they are, what's going on, and then speaking, having those hard conversations. Uh, let me ask you, what is more damaging to a relationship than ultimately saying, is what you say when you go to the silent treatment, ultimately saying that it's not your relationship, this relationship is not worth a hard conversation. The third thing we do, the next step, we bear burdens with and for the other person. Before I came to Needville, I served as an associate pastor and my senior pastor had a phrase that he used, I kid you not, between 10 and 20 times every single week. It got to be a joke that we would finish the sentence for him, which I know that that was kind of the purpose. But it was a great piece of wisdom. He would always say, the problem is never the problem. Some of you may know that phrase. But let me th- ask you, have you ever had one of those terrible days? I, we all know the terrible, those terrible days where everything you touch goes to, goes to pot. Every computer you touch breaks. No matter how hard you try, you're five minutes late to everywhere you go. You know those days, right? You have one of those days, you get home, your spouse comes over and kisses you on the cheek and says, how was your day, honey? And you explode. Your spouse do anything? No. But you exploded at her or him. Why? Because they're there. Because you can't get mad at a clock when you're late. You can't really get mad at the people in traffic because they're stuck there with you and no matter how much you yell at the steering wheel, it it really doesn't care. No. You get mad at your spouse. But is the conflict really with your spouse? No. You see, if we can listen to the other person and speak truth and life into them, then we can find out how to bear a burden that caused the conflict to begin with. Not maybe, maybe bear the conflict for them or just simply be with them. Walking beside them and helping them carry whatever burden happens to be on their shoulders at that time. But note, we can't do that if we aren't listening to them. We can't do that if we're giving them the silent treatment and not talking to them. We have to do do those two things and then we can help them and serve them into a better place. Now the last step and the last thing I want to say here is one that I say with some trepidation and I want to say it very lightly but it does need to be said. We serve others by helping them to get out of their own transgressions. We see this a lot with alcoholics or drug addicts or uh, liars or cheaters or a bunch of different horrible situations that people sometimes get themselves into, right? We call them interventions, right? Where a group of people, get, a group of family members and, and close friends get together to tell the one person how their actions, how their bad habits are affecting their loved ones in the hopes that they will change their course. 
Now, please don't hear me say that, the, that we as Christians need to go out into the world and tell other people how to live their lives or that we should go to any stranger that we find and say, yeah, if you did this, 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 then you wouldn't have this problem. That's not what I'm saying. This is not a license to go out and tell everyone you know what is wrong with them. But if we are going to serve others, we must be willing to speak the hard truth in love to those whom we are in relationship with so that we can build that rec re relationship even further and reconcile ourselves to each other. You see where the focus lies. If your focus is on simply just highlighting the problems and the sins of your neighbor, you're not doing anything more than just making sure you win the conflict. But if your focus is on making sure that you can build a relationship together, that you can become true brothers and sisters again, that they can see the face of God, that's a different focus entirely. And that's a different conversation entirely. Now, my final point this morning looking in the scriptures is actually a fairly short one, but it's, a fairly, but it's probably the most powerful one. What if the church actually practiced the divine option of conflict resolution? What if we as individuals, Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, disciples of Christ, actually took this option seriously and confronted conflict in this way, in the reconciling way? I can tell you the world would go completely nuts. <laughs> I have to admit, it would ha it might be, it might just be the best evangelical tool the church ever had. Because what is one of the biggest things that the entire world says negatively about the Christian church? They're judgmental hypocrites, right? Ever had a conversation with an atheist or someone who has no desire to ever enter and step, set foot into a church? Nine times out of ten, it's because the time that they did or the people that they've known that are Christians are judgmental and hypocrites. And they have no desire to be part of that. And who could blame them? Who wants to be a part of a group of people that are judgmental and hypocr hypocritical? No one. So here's the bottom line, though. They believe all of that, they believe those two adjectives to describe Christians because that's what they have seen. The world will never hear God's truth. I can stand here and read the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation and I can broadcast, I can spend all of the world's money advertising it on YouTube and Facebook and it won't make a hill of beans a difference. until they observe his truth in his people. To put it in a more of a common way, this is something that my youth director always used to tell us on a daily, uh, at least a weekly, if not a daily, he would tell us that every time he got an opportunity, he would look at us and remind us as youth, you may well be the only Bible that anyone will ever read. How close are you to the real thing? So, this week, you will encounter conflict. I guarantee it. We all will. I want you to think of all the conflict that surrounds us on a daily basis. Let's go back to those phrases, shall we? Black lives matter. Blue lives matter. All lives matter. But how can God be glorified in that conflict? How about a, another, two, a, another two names? Donald Trump and Joe Biden. How can I, and again, this is, a, this is a personal question. How can I glorify God in that conflict? You see, if this is how we approach conflict, we will have a much different and a much more powerful way to handle it so that it becomes an opportunity for the inbreaking of the Spirit into this world.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are surrounded by conflict at every angle. At every turn, there is some little conflict or massive conflict that berates us and knocks us down. Father, conflict is so much a part of our lives that we have gotten to the point where we see only two options. We either stand up for ourselves and make sure that we will never be a doormat to anyone, that we make sure that we win every argument we ever get into, or we avoid everything. We escape. We don't want to ruffle the feathers. We don't want to get people mad. We don't want to do anything else. We just want to live our lives in peace. So Father, we pray this morning that you would help us to see that there is a better option, a third option, a divine option that you have explored, you have experienced, you have shown to each and every one of us. Help us to be your hands and feet. Help us to show the world that you don't have to win every argument. You don't have to avoid every conflict. But instead, we must reconcile our brothers and sisters together so that all of humanity is in relationship not only with each other, but with you. Help us to be that kind of conflict manager. We pray all this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's that time for our invitation. This morning, I would invite you as we sing our final hymn to truly think about some of the conflicts that have been going on in your life. Maybe you have that one person that you've been in real deep conflict with. Whether it's over one of the societal things that's going on with COVID-19 or racism or the presidential uh, candidates or whatever. Or maybe it's just something personal. Maybe it's a personal slight or, uh, or, some, or a mistake that's been made either on your part or their part that has driven a wedge between the two of you. And I want you to start thinking about what would happen if you approached that conflict, no matter how deep it is, no matter how long it's been going on, if you approach that conflict in a new light, a divine light, a light that says that we want to reconcile each other to each other and then to God. We're going to sing hymn number 545, The Church's One Foundation. And I want you to really listen to the words of the song. And I want you to pray as we're singing about the conflicts in your life and how a reconciling option would be so much better than anything else. Let's sing together. The church is one found is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his only bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet one o'er all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy Asunder my heresies distressed. Yet saints, their watch are keeping their.
their cry goes up how long and soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war she waits the consummation of peace forevermore till with a vision glorious her longing eyes are blessed and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest yet she on earth hath union with God the three in one and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one O happy ones and holy Lord give us grace that we like them the meek and lonely on high may dwell with thee. Brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us for another wonderful worship service. I hope that you enjoyed your time here. If you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube channel with the subscribe button down below the video. Like the video and like our Facebook page. All of the information that you will need Le uh, going into the future will be posted either in one of these two locations and usually in both that way you'll be up to date with everything that's happening here at the church if you would like to be part of VBS and you can't find the uh, the information it's on our Facebook page it's also on our web page or you can also contact me and I will let you know how we can help you get your kids into VBS for this summer Brothers and sisters, I pray that you have a healthy and safe week. Keep your masks on, keep washing the hands, and keep the safe distance between y'all so that we can make sure that we get back to normalcy as quickly as humanly possible. God bless you all.